<clears throat> okay, guys, we're going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter one, part seven. The title of this lesson is Inverse Relations and Functions. So an inverse relation. So when we have a relation, it's going to map a domain to a range. So an inverse relation just does the opposite. It maps the range back to the domain. So this is the relation, and this is its inverse. So it just undoes what a function does. And the same is true for a function. So if we're talking specifically about a function, not just any relation, it's going to take that function's domain, plug that into f of x, and map it to the range. So the inverse function, which is indicated with this superscript negative 1, is going to take that range value and map it back to the original domain value. Okay, so uh, one to oneness. This is a property of um, a relation. where every range value comes from only one domain value. So in other words, it passes a horizontal You guys remember the vertical line test tests for functionality. Well, the horizontal line test tests for one to oneness. And one to oneness is important because only one to one functions have an inverse. So only one to one functions have an inverse. So if it's not one-to-one, -one, it does not have an inverse. The horizontal line test is demonstrated here. So you, you would have to, it would have to be the case that a horizontal line would never touch two points, which this one would pass it. So uh, f, of, f inverse exists for this f of x. So let's apply the horizontal line test. Here we've got uh, 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. So we're going to determine whether it has an inverse function by graphing and employing the uh, horizontal line test. 4x squared is the first term, plus 4x, plus 1. So I'm going to zoom 6 here. Oops. Okay. Did not detect my, one of my clicks there. Okay, here we go. So we see a parabola that's uh, slightly left of the origin in its vertex. And if we drew a horizontal line here, it would touch two points anywhere above zero. So this fails, the horizontal line test, and we say that its inverse function does not exist. Oh, sorry, circle the wrong one there. No, the inverse function does not exist. So there is no inverse function. All right, so here's another one. This one is x to the fifth plus x cubed minus one. Here we see it is uh, going to pass the horizontal line test. And if you look right around negative one, it looks really flat, but it never quite gets exactly flat. So it will pass the horizontal line test. And if we zoom in real close to that, um, you'll see. So I'll change it to go from negative 2 to 2, and then, uh, oh, I don't know, negative 2 to 0. So that zooms in on that part that looked kind of flat. But you'll see it never gets exactly flat. It still kind of looks flat here. We'd have to zoom in even more for you to see. But it is slightly inclined throughout there. Never actually flat between two points. So this is a yes, the f inverse does exist. 
So here's one for you. Pause the video, see if you can figure it out, and then come back. Okay, so 3 over x minus 1, if we graph that, notice my use of parentheses here. It's important, and I need to zoom 6. Um, so this has a mathematical artifact here, a uh, graphical artifact. That vertical line doesn't actually exist. So when it shows us this, what it means is this. Something more like that. So that will pass the horizontal line test. And so its inverse does exist. Okay, so the steps for finding an inverse function. First of all, determine whether the inverse exists using the horizontal line test. And then you're going to replace um, y with f of x, and then we're going to switch x and y. And I'll, and I'll show you those steps um, in a way that I use them on the first example. Solve for y, replace with f inverse of x, and then state any domain restrictions. So follow that step numbering the way the book does. I'll show you the way I number the steps. First of all, step one, uh, we're going to replace y with f of x if it's, or I'm sorry, f of x with y. So that's going to look like this. y equals x over 2x minus 1. So f of x becomes y if it's not already. Sometimes it already is. Step two is going to be uh, switch all x's to y's and all y's to x's. So that becomes x equals y over 2y minus 1. Now we're going to solve for y. That's going to be particularly tricky here because we have a y in both the numerator and denominator, but I'll show you how to do it. The first algebraic step in order to solve this is going to be to multiply both sides by the denominator. So 2y minus 1 times x equals y over 2y minus 1 times 2y minus 1. So on the right side of this, those two will cancel, and it will just become y. On the left side, we need to distribute. That's 2xy minus 1 equals y. So the next step is going to be to get everything with a y on the left and everything without a y on the right. So I'm going to do that by subtracting y and then adding 1 to each side. So if I subtract y and add 1 to each side, the result is this. Now I'll factor out the y. And now I'll divide by 2x minus 1. So this is kind of a weird result, because you see that's the original function. Oops, where did I go wrong? Oh, that should be next. Sorry. Maybe there was a boo-boo somewhere. There we go. So x over 2x minus 1. So that is the original function, showing that it is its own inverse. And then finally, the last step, which is going to be step 4, y is going to become f inverse of x. So um, that'll look like this. So f of x equals x over f inverse of x equals x over 2x minus 1. And being its own inverse is interesting. So if I plug it in here, x divided by 2x minus 1, and graph. You know how inverses work. So let's just say I plug in 2 here. Trace 2. So that gives me 2 thirds. Now if I plugged in 2 thirds, you see it gives me 2. So it is its own inverse. If you map a value from the domain to the range, the same expression will map the range value back to the domain, original domain value. 
So it's kind of interesting, uh, but not very satisfying to get the same result. Anyway, f inverse of x does exist, and it is the same expression. All right, example two, part b. <clears throat> so first step, f of x becomes y. And so y equals 2 times the square root of x minus 1. Step 2, um, x's and y's are switched. So x equals 2 times the square root of y uh, minus 1. Now, this one does have a domain restriction. So domain restrictions uh, on the function are not going to be, they're not going to translate exactly. It's a little more complicated than that. So, so this has the domain, the original function f of x has the domain of x minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. In other words, x is greater than or equal to 1. So that's important, but more important to us is the range. So the range of that original function, if I were to graph it, uh, so it's going to sh be shifted one unit to the right, and it's going to go up like this. So you see how the range is going to be uh, y is greater than or equal to 0. So y greater than or equal to 0 um, is the range of the original function. Well, this is going to be the domain of the inverse. Because you remember the domain, or the inverse, takes a value from the range and maps it back to the domain. So this original range at the very end of this problem will be the domain of our inverse. Okay, moving on. So step three, y equals what? So I'm going to divide both sides by two. Then I'm going to square both sides. Then I'm going to add one to each side. And now I'm going to take, this is step four. And remember that is y becomes f inverse of x. And I'm also going to switch around the order here. So there's our inverse, but we need to constrain the domain, remember. So the domain is going to be uh, x such that x is greater than or equal to 0. And that comes from the original range. So whatever restrictions were on y in the original range become restrictions on x in the domain of the inverse. So remember that the inverse takes its values from the range of the original function. So it can only draw from what range existed. That was only y greater than 0. So here I can only take x's for the inverse that are greater than or equal to 0. So remember that we switched the x's and the y's. So that's why the range and the domain flip for the inverse. This domain is important because it's not implicit. In other words, it's not a domain restriction you would expect this expression to have on its own. It's only because it is the inverse of that other function that this domain restriction exists. Okay, so here's one for you. Go ahead and give it a go, pause the video, come back and see if you got it right. All right, <clears throat> here we go. So first step, f of x becomes y. Second step, the x's and the y's are switched. Step three, algebraically solve. And my first step is going to be to multiply both sides by that denominator. The denominators will cancel on the right. And over here, that is xy minus x. So we're going to get everything with a y on the left by subtracting y. And everything without a y on the right by adding x. So I've subtracted y from each side and added x to each side to get here. Now I'm going to factor out the y. Now I'm going to divide away x minus 1. 
Now I've solved for y. I need to change y to f inverse of x. And once again, with a rational expression, we find it is its own inverse. That won't always be the case, but it is sometimes the case, and we've seen it twice here. So uh, domain constraints. So if we think about uh, this original function, its domain is going to be x is not equal to 1. But let's graph it so we can get an idea about its range. So x, I need parentheses here, x plus 2 in parentheses divided by x minus 1 in parentheses. If I graph it, <clears throat> I get this. So I'm going to see the same thing on the range. Y could never equal 1. At least that's what it looks like. So if I trace along here, I see I'm getting bigger and bigger, approaching 1 from the bottom, but I'll never quite get there. It's what's called an asymptote. It's going to get closer and closer to 1 and never quite get there. And if I go with it over here on the other side, um, I'll see the same is true, but I'll be approaching it from the top. So the range for this would be y is not equal to 1. And that means the domain of our inverse is going to be x is never equal to 1. And that would make sense in this case. It is implicit, but it won't always be like the previous problem. Important to state that. All right, so um, composition of inverse functions. So this is a way to test for inverseness. So if two functions are inverses, their composition in either direction will be the identity function. In other words, if we compose them, the result will be just x. And if that's the case, we know there are inverses. If anything other than x is found through composition of functions, they are not inverses. <clears throat> okay, so let's verify that f and g are inverses. So I'm going to find f of g of x. And I know if I get x, then this is uh, two inverse functions. So that's f evaluated at g of x. And so that is f evaluated at 3 halves times x minus 2. So that's 2 thirds times instead of x, it's this, 3 halves, and then plus 2. Remember that expression just gets plugged in for x when we compose two functions. Well, 2 thirds and 3 halves are going to multiply together to make 1, so they effectively cancel each other out. So I get x minus 2 plus 2, minus 2 and plus 2 cancel each other out, and I get just x, the identity function, and so they are inverse functions. I have established inverseness. Okay. Here's one for you. Try your hand at it. Uh, pause the video, then come back and see if you got it right. Okay, here we go. So um, this is x squared minus 2, where x is greater than 0, and then the square root of x plus 2. So are these inverses of each other? In other words, is f of g of x equal to just x? Well, let's find out. f evaluated at g of x. So that's f evaluated at the square root of x plus 2. So that's uh, the square root of x plus 2 squared minus 2. Taking the square root and squaring, an expression cancels out. So that's just x plus 2 minus 2. Those cancel. I get just x. And these are inverses. So the identity function here establishes inverseness. And sometimes the book asks you to go both ways, but that's a redundancy. That would just be a way to double check yourself for an error. Either way, if g of f or f of g is the identity function, it shows these are inverses. Okay, example four. Now this is actually strangely hard because uh, the way inverses work graphically 
is each is a reflection of the other in the line y equals x, the identity function. So each is the other reflected around the identity function. So let's see. Would be something like that. Actually, I did that kind of poorly. Let me try that again. So. That's a little better. But you get the idea. It's, it's difficult to do it visually. Each is the other reflected over the line y equals x. So that's a pretty good sketch. Not perfect by any means. So here's one for you. Try to sketch the inverse based on the relationship you know it has with its inverse and the line y equals x. Pause video and then come back. Okay, so here we are. And so it's going to have uh, this rotated around. So imagine I flip this over. So that's going to be, um, gosh, not the easiest thing to do. But you guys get the idea. We'll flip it over the y equals x line. So, yeah, it would be like this. And straight. So that is a sketch of the inverse. So here's a word problem. The fixed costs for manufacturing one type of stereo system are $96,000. So that's to set up the original manufacturing assembly line or what have you. And then 80, 80 per unit. So the total cost of making X stereos is given by 96,000 plus 80 X. Explain why the inverse exists and then find that inverse. So the inverse exists because we're mapping the costs uh, or the number of stereos produced to the total cost. And we can also map the total cost back to the number of uh, stereos produced. So it makes sense that it would go in both directions. Okay. so. Let's say y equals 96,000 plus 80x. And then um, we're going to switch the x and y. And we're going to solve this for y. So I'm going to subtract x from each side. And I'm going to subtract 80y from each side to get this expression. Now I'll divide by negative 80. So this expression over here, uh, y equals 96,000 minus x over negative 80. So what I'm going to do is factor out a negative 1 from the numerator by flipping that difference. And then that will allow me to cancel out that negative in the bottom. So the result is going to be x minus 96,000 over 80. And that is my f inverse of x. So the, the input here will be the total cost, and the output will be the number of stereos produced, which is the inverse of the original function. Okay. We'll skip over that one. So I'd like for you guys to complete for me by the due date, page 72 through 20 even. I'll see you next time.